Oh, well, goodness, all, all, all these diligent note takers. I actually saw John's notes once. It was all, all lines of Zs. Z. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes. So, it's all right. special prize for anyone who manages to stay awake tonight. Um, it's it's long been my conviction and sort of like practice that when it comes to preparing Bible studies, I mean, obviously there are times when you end up doing something that you don't prepare for because if it's a question time, then obviously there's nothing to prepare for and sometimes you go somewhere or come along here and you just get a thing all right you know you know at that moment this is what the Lord wants to do but normatively obviously one's doing Bible studies with prepared notes and you know I've always been of the conviction that the the part of the the key to ensuring that the actual giving of the teaching is anointed that that part of the key to that is preparing in a very diligent way and getting an anointing on preparing and, and, and by the time I end up with the notes that are going to be used as I do a Bible study. I mean, they, they, they've undergone revision after revision and, you know, all done just, just like that. You know, obviously I'm very careful because if you end up with notes that don't make sense, obviously I'm the one <laughs> who's really going to suffer when I'm trying to make sense of notes that don't make sense. And, and it was sort of like to my horror, first thing this morning, I, I just looked at the notes for tonight's study. I could scarcely understand a word of them. You know, I, I, could, could, I thought, what, what on earth was I going on about when I prepared this one? But it wasn't that you know that there's anything there that I didn't agree with or anything. But I just thought I couldn't couldn't understand them. So I'm very glad that 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 was first thing this morning because it's given me all day, obviously, to you know to revise them and do them again. So I was very pleased about that. So I started to think, what would have happened if I'd have just come, you know, or at five o'clock this evening, gone through the notes and then thought, oh, I don't understand a word of them. So I'm just sort of glad. That um, I'll check that first thing this morning. But there you go. I don't know how that got through. Uh, my first thought was, was this like the first week after I gave up smoking? But it wasn't. So, so that was. They, they were, they were the notes of a man trying to give up smoking. You know, <laughs> although that they were done before I actually gave up smoking. So, uh, odd, odd that, isn't it? Right. Okay. So, um, we're on James chapter four, and uh, we've got the last few verses of chapter four to do tonight. So. Uh, Find uh, verse 13. <clears throat> right, okay, so this is James 4, and we'll read from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain, whereas you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live, and we shall do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoever knows what is right to do, and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Right, now, we, we come now to the last of, of James's sort of like two kinds of everything. Remember, we've seen that one of the little techniques, literarily speaking, that he's using in the letter um, is, is he's coming up, he's saying, look, with everything, there are two kinds of it. There's the true and the false. There's the carnal, there's the spiritual. There's kind of the new nature and the old nature. There's the genuine and the counterfeit. And we come tonight to, to the last of his, look, there are two kinds of everything here. And uh, you know, we saw it with testing. He said there's two kinds of testing. There's the testing the Lord puts you through, that's genuine. But there's the testing, i.e. the trials and tribulations that we end up going through as a result of stepping out of God's will. And that's, that's of the flesh. Uh, he said there, there's genuine faith and there's carnal faith. There's a counterfeit to faith. There's a true and a false. We saw it with wisdom. He said there's the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. And then we saw last time that there's true and false judging, isn't there? You can judge rightly or you can judge wrongly. And, uh, and so tonight we move on to the last of his two kinds of everything. And, uh, and what he moves on to now is, uh, is that there are two kinds of confidence you can have as a Christian in the future. And what we're going to see him dealing with here is a, a false confidence in regards to our futures. And that what he's doing, he's highlighting our outlook on, or our attitude towards, our future plans, um, our future actions, all the ideas we've got for the future, how we perceive our future, i.e. from today onwards, what's going to happen to us in regards to the future. 
And we're seeing that that is what James here is homing in on, a false confidence. Um, now then, obviously, as Christians, it's absolutely right and proper that, that we can have complete confidence in the Lord regarding the days that are to come and the years that are to come, obviously. I mean, you know, sort of like, he, he's Lord. We can trust him for our futures. We can have confidence in the future that he's planned out for us. And it, it's certainly true as well that we can expect to know with reasonable certainty, um, you know, sort of like specific things that he reveals to us in regards to guidance, in regards to the future. So it's certainly true to say that we can have confidence for the future in general, because obviously the Lord's in charge of it, and obviously it's quite valid in that there are times when the Lord reveals things to us about the future, and when he has genuinely done that, then we can have reasonable certainty that obviously that they're going to, to come to pass. So I want to emphasise that I'm not in any way tonight uh, in dealing with the negative, saying that the positive side of this doesn't exist, as you will see. But what James is combating here is, in actual fact, not a genuine confidence in the Lord and the future he has for us at all. He's combating something that is quite different. And he's combating the idea of the thing that can happen um, amongst us at times when we can have a confidence regarding the future as Christians, which, although it's all dressed up in spiritual terms, you know, it's all dressed up in, well, the Lord's going to do this and the Lord's going to do that, blah, blah, blah. But he's, he's talking about incidences of that when it isn't actually trusting the Lord at all. But what it really is, is a false confidence in self and a kind of a presumption, a kind of an arrogance, a pride um, of believing that it's okay to control our own lives. So what we're going to be seeing tonight is that you can have two believers, and believer A is fully confident in the Lord for his future. And indeed, there may be things that the Lord has revealed to him about his or her future that he or she is reasonably certain about and secure in, all right? And then we're going to see that you can have someone else who, whilst using all the same words as believer A, in actual fact, isn't trusting in the Lord at all, but is merely laying out their own lives as they want their lives to go, and then hooking the Lord's name in to try and convince themselves that it's going to happen just the way they want it to. Can you see the difference there? That the latter is actually, it's, it's the desire for us to control our own lives. It's an attempt for us to control our own lives, but having it all dressed up in the language of trusting God for the future. Um, I mean, there's, there's that, that chorus. We don't actually sing it, but uh, I think some of you know it. And the words go, I know who holds the future, and he guides me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. And that chorus represents an absolute truth, that God does hold the future. And therefore, because God holds our future, and because he guides us with his hands, therefore, we can have absolute confidence. But here's the point. There's a difference, and this is the difference you've got to get tonight to understand the rest of what I'm going to say. There's a difference between having confidence in the one who holds the future, all right? There's a difference between that confidence in God as the one who holds the future and confidence in the future itself. Now, can you see the difference there? You can have Christian A who is confident in the Lord for their future. Their confidence rests in the Lord. But you can have Christian B, they're confident in the future. And rather than living securely in the Lord now, they're kind of like living in a fantasy, a kind of, I can't live the full Christian life now until this, that or the other happens in the future. Do you see the difference? It's the difference between having your security in the Lord now and having your security in things that haven't happened yet, but that you want to happen in the future. One is depending on the Lord, the other is dependent on things happening in the future, and there's a difference. So here's the question. Is our security in the Lord, here and now, in regards to our future and everything else, or is our security in actual fact 
resting on things that we want to happen in the future but haven't happened yet. Can you see the difference? And indeed it can go further. You can have a Christian, and we've all done this at times, I know that I have, in the sense that sort of somehow you've got these ideas in your head for the future, what you want. And, and somehow that future that you end up, well, I'm really trusting God for this future, that future is merely what we want. I mean, they're virtually my demands for my future. And ultimately, I'm only going to be happy if God complies with me. Now, can you see that difference there? It's the difference between having confidence in God for the future rather than placing our confidence in the future itself and what we're going to actually be doing. Now then, I repeat here because it's important, we can obviously expect in many instances to have a reasonable certainty about the future. There are times when God will reveal things to us. You know, so I mean, classic example, for many years as a single man I knew I was going to marry. Now, that was a reasonable certainty in the Lord that I had. You know, for many years, as a single man, I, I would have said to someone, no, I'm utterly confident in the Lord, I'm going to marry. And indeed I did. That was proved to be right. But part of the struggle that one had to go through was in the sense of being able to live the Christian life and follow the Lord, secure in the knowledge that he had the future in tow, in hand, rather than all the time thinking, I can't live the Christian life to the full until I get a wife, until this thing in the future that I need to happen has happened. Can you see the difference there? So I'm not saying that any instance of somebody being assured about something that's going to happen in the future, I'm not saying that that is obviously the self-will that James is talking about here. We can expect reasonable certainty in regards to things the Lord tells us about our future. But the point is, We've got to make sure that that is genuine trust in the Lord rather than simply self, us, being in control and kind of boiling down to, a well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Can you see the difference? So again, you can have Christian A who say single and wanting to marry, no problem there, needing to marry, no, you know, fine. And knowing, being absolutely confident that at the right time God will grant their need and desire. But you can have Christian B, who is proving utterly unable to follow the Lord. And the reason they give is, well, I haven't got a wife yet. If God wants me to live the Christian life, then I've got to get married, haven't I? Can you see the difference? That is confidence in the future. That is us making our demands on the Lord. That is, if you like, the, the, the fleshly counterfeit of the genuine hope in the future that we can have in regards to things that God has revealed to us. So, the point is, there are many areas where we can expect to have certainty about the future, reasonable certainty, where we can think, well, I really believe that the Lord has revealed this about the future. I something he's going to do, a situation he's going to move me into, or a situation he's going to move me out of, or something that, you know, sort of like, you know, maybe one day, um, you know, I know I'm going to have a different job, something that's more fulfilling. The Lord has shown me that. No problem with that at all. But the danger that we need to be aware of is how that can very easily become, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You see, now, when that happens, as soon as we get this cock sure, well this is going to happen and that's going to happen, it's forgetting two things. As soon as we too much get into this thing, well I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that in regards to the future, it forgets two things. Firstly, it forgets our nothingness before the Lord. I mean, you know, James talking about here, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such a town and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and I'm going to trade and I'm going to get rich and God's going to prosper me. Well, fine. All that is spiritual talk may well be true. But here James is saying there are times when the Christian who's saying that sort of thing really is controlling their own lives and they've forgotten their nothingness before the Lord. Now, when I talk about our nothingness, I don't mean as in Eastern faiths that you don't exist. I mean, Eastern religion believes we're nothing in the sense that they don't believe we actually exist. You know, it's pantheism. Everything is God. So we are a dream that God's having. We are a, f a phase that God's going through. So to the Eastern faith, salvation is realising your nothingness, realising that you don't actually exist. I'm not meaning that. And neither, when I talk about our nothingness before God, am I saying we don't matter. Of course we do, very much. We mattered enough to God for him to, to send Jesus to die for us. 
But when I talk about remembering our nothingness before the Lord, it's in the context of verse 14. Let's read it. Whereas, he says, you don't know about tomorrow. Here, Christians saying, well, tomorrow we're going to do this, that, and the other. He says, look, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You see, that's what I mean by our nothingness. I mean, think of it like this. For each one of us, all right, God's got an off switch in heaven, right? And, and his finger is just over this off switch. And all he's got to do is turn you off and bang, your life is over. Now, praise God, we'll be going to heaven. But can you see, that is the bigness, that is the everythingness of the Lord. The fact that for heaven's sake, we live and die at his bidding. We don't even know if we're going to be here tomorrow. So therefore, in the light of that, when we start, well, tomorrow we're going to do this, and then the next day we're going to do that, can you see, we've forgotten our nothingness before him. The fact that he's got control of our on-off switch. And all he's got to do is press that button, and he turns us <coughs> off, and life is over, with all our plans and everything. So that's the first thing that this, oh, well, you know, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, that's the first thing. It forgets that our lives are a, a mist that vanishes, an early morning mist, and it can be gone, just like that, at any time. It's, it's basically the confidence of a believer who's got too big for their boots. You know, a, a kind of a, well, in the future we're going to do this, that and the other. That is, that is the talk of a believer. Not in genuine faith in the Lord in regards to the future, but that is the talk of when we've got too big for our boots. And then the second thing, all this, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You know, tomorrow we'll go and trade here and then the day after we'll go and trade there. The second thing it forgets is that the only thing that matters is God's will. God's <coughs> will. Not our will at all. God's will is the only thing that counts. In verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say. So, here you've got believers saying, well, tomorrow this is the way it's going to be, and then after that there's going to be this, and, and then that, you know, and life, all, all planned out, all right? And James is saying, no, rather than that, say, if the Lord wills, we shall live, and we shall do this or that. Now, can you see the difference there? The difference between the cockiness of, well, this is what we're going to do, and, well, if the Lord wills, if the Lord lets us live long enough, then we will do this, that, or the other. Can you see that? And uh, so what we've got here, and I repeat, is not James saying, well, look, any certainty that you feel you have about the future is wrong. He's not saying that. It's right that we have certainty about things that God has revealed us for our future. That's right and proper. James isn't speaking against that. James is trying to expose the carnal counterfeit to that, which uses all the spiritual language of the genuine, but in reality is simply when we as Christians are planning out our own lives. This is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that. I.e. us planning out our own lives, but dressing it up in the language of it being the Lord's doing. Now, notice here that in regards to this, in verse 13, that the example that James uses in regards to this is trade and, and commerce. That he's, he's picking on their jobs. And the reason that he's doing this is that your work, okay, is obviously one of the most important aspects of your life. And that is the example that James kind of uses, i.e. future business plans, if you like. Now, We've got to realise, of course, there is nothing wrong with long-term planning. Absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, you've got to actually do it. In regards to your work, very often there has to be long-term planning. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and in fact, there's nothing wrong with long-term planning in regards to other things as well. It's not the long-term planning that is the problem here. But what James is trying to get at here is when Christians as the Lord's people, we do our kind of long-term planning, uh, I mean, in regards to things that are completely legitimate, no problem with them, uh, but we're doing our long-term planning and, and our future is all nicely, you know, laid out before us that this is how it's going to be and that's how it's going to be. And we do this, our long-term planning, on, on the assumption that, well, then, of course, this is definitely how it's going to be. And there's no flexibility there's no openness to the fact that these long-term plans that we have, that it's fine that we've made them, 
But there's no openness to the fact that the Lord might not agree with them. And that's the point. When the Lord might want to change them at any time. Because after all, you may have planned five, six years ahead, no reason you shouldn't. But oughtn't we to bear in mind that uh, why are we assuming that, that, that five or six years ahead that we're seeing it the same as the Lord is? You see? His idea of our future might be vastly different from our idea of our future. So therefore, with any long-term planning, it must always be with the openness that God can change anything at any time. And so the problem that James is picking on here is kind of an arrogant long-term planning, a, a proud long-term planning that isn't actually submitted to the Lord at all. I.e., this is what I have planned out, and therefore this is what it's going to be. Um, it's, it's an attitude towards the future that, in reality, only accounts for what we want. I mean, however much we talk about the Lord this and the Lord that, it's what we want. And it's what we think ought to happen. And can actually cut the Lord out completely. And that's why in verse 15 he says, look, you're bo you boast in your arrogance. Because when we think like that, again, we've got too big for our boots. And, and he says, look, in, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live. And we shall do this and do that. Now, just notice there, James is saying, what you're doing, all right, is you're saying, well, tomorrow we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other, all these plans. The plans, no problem with the plans per se. But what you're doing is, tomorrow we're going to do this, tomorrow we're going to do that, blah, blah, blah. Now, he says, rather, this is what you ought to do. And then he says, if the Lord wills. Now, we'd expect him to say, what you should say is, if it's God's will, you can do, I will do this and I will do that. But he doesn't say that. He says the attitude we've got to have isn't if the Lord wills, we'll do this, that or the other. The attitude is if we're still alive in the morning and then we find out it's the Lord's will, we can do this, that or the other. Can you see, he's keeping us in our place. Because regardless of all the assumptions that we have about tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, the truth of the matter is that in the morning, if the Lord wants to turn anyone's button off, they're turned off. Can you see? Now, that's not meaning to say he is definitely going to turn anyone's button off. I hope he doesn't. I, I hope I continue to be switched on down here tomorrow. And obviously, I must plan ahead for tomorrow accordingly. But the point is, what James is saying is, look, in regards to the future, and all your plans and all your hopes, all your aspirations for the future, and there's nothing wrong with any of them, all right? What he's saying, in regards to it, though, we must ensure that we're living on the basis that our futures, like everything else, belong to the Lord. You see, my future belongs to the Lord. It doesn't actually belong to me. Our futures are the property of the Lord, not our property. And the reason that our futures are the property of the Lord is because we are the property of the Lord. He owns us lot, sock and barrel. And if you think about it, isn't it easy um, to, even whilst acknowledging that I in the here and now, I belong to Jesus, that one can acknowledge that with all your heart, but nevertheless catch yourself planning for the future as if somehow that's down to us. Can you see the point? That is what James is highlighting here. We've got to make sure that our futures are surrendered to the Lord because they belong to him. Back to that chorus. I know who holds the future because he guides me with his hand. Now, that is, is biblical imagery, all right, and it's brilliant because what it communicates, the Lord holds the future and he guides us with his hand. So he's holding my future in his hand, but he's guiding me with his hand. Everything is in his hand, because the whole lot belongs to him. It is his to handle. And what we've got to make sure is that in our minds, we're not sort of like, you know, jumping out of his hand and, and, and going off and, and planning our own thing. Our futures do belong to him, not to us at all. And in our outlook concerning them, our attitude concerning them, our hopes, our aspirations, we must all the time bear in mind that, just as in the here and now, so it's got to be in regards to the future and how we think about it, Lord, your will be done, not my will be done. 
it's down to you, Lord. Now, we've got to be clear, really clear at this point, exactly the sort of things that James is talking about when he's saying, look, with all these plans that we make for the future, let's be careful that it's not us controlling our own lives. Let's be careful, you know, that it's not this kind of, well, today we'll do this and tomorrow we'll do that and then the day after we'll do that. So he says that, that's pride. Now, he's saying, look, all this is in regards to things that are legitimate. I.e., obviously, if James was talking about things like, uh, well, look, you know, make sure in the future you, you don't commit adultery. Well, I, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's not, we have no plans in the future for that. Because obviously there are many things that shouldn't be part of any believer's future, just straight sinful things, all right? But the point is, they're not the sort of things that he's talking about. He's not saying, hey, I, I, I hear you're saying that, well, tomorrow we're going to, you know, go down and nick some videos, and then the day after we're going to go and beat an old lady up, and, and then the day after that we're, you know, going to go and paint the town red and get some women and go and get some drinkiness. No, he's not correcting them for that. All the plans they're making are legitimate plans. That's the point. He's not saying make sure you haven't got any plans to, to sin in the future. He's talking about things like business planning. And this whole area that he's addressing in regards to our futures are things that in themselves are quite okay. They are perfectly legitimate things. There is nothing wrong with trading. And that's the example that he uses. There is nothing wrong with it at all. And we've got to really underline this. No, you're saying, oh, well, I mean, no, I'm not planning to do anything sinful in the future, so I'm therefore, you know, sort of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm praying by the grace of the Lord that in the future he'll, he'll keep me from sin or whatever. That's, that's not what James is talking about. He's talking about all the things that we think of in regards to our future that in themselves are quite legitimate. There's nothing wrong with them. There may be desires which the, themselves are, are, are quite nothing wrong with them at all. I mean, if you're a businessman to want to expand your business, for instance, what's the problem with that? Absolutely nothing. And that is the sort of thing that he's talking about. But he's saying, nevertheless, you've got to make sure that it's all submitted to the Lord. And that the whole time, the proviso is over absolutely every plan that we make, that when the time comes, well, if it's God's will. Whereas the sinful nature, even in regards to these kind of things that are perfectly legitimate and okay, the veering of our hearts will always be on the assumption of, well, I want it, so it must be God's will, mustn't it? Can you see what I mean? And the burden of proof, often to us, is, is, is for it to be demonstrated that it isn't God's will. Now, what, what James is saying, don't just assume that your outlook on the future is the same as God's. There might be changes that he wants to make. I mean, let's give examples, all right? Times when you're, you know, like considering, maybe planning ahead, in regards to the future, and things that are in themselves are okay, no problem. I mean, for example, moving house, that would be an example. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to move house, so there's an example. But the question is, is that plan submitted to the Lord? Going on holiday, it's nice and topical, isn't it? Summer, going on holiday, nothing wrong with that. Um, buying this, that or the other. Nothing wrong with buying things, future plans. Oh, well, you know, next month I'm hoping to, blah, 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 blah. Nothing wrong with that. These are the kind of examples that, that, that James is covering. On the other hand, though, it could be like future ministry. It could be like, you know, your, your, you know like things that you believe that, that God is going to use you for in the future. It might be something blatantly what you might call spiritual there, okay? And, of course, the question, ultimately, with all these things... Isn't, are these desires right or wrong? There's nothing wrong with these desires. There's nothing wrong with anyone having such plans for the future. The question is, is it subject to the Lord? Are the very plans themselves submitted to his will? So that ultimately, at the end of the day, if he says no, fine. Because the point is, if I want to do something, and it might be quite legitimate, if I want to do something in the future, if that isn't God's will for me, well, the point is it's his future, so he's got every right to say no to it. Even though it's me, it's to do with, because he owns me. Um, there's a story that Corrie ten Boom tells, it's, it's quite good, and it was in regards to, you know, to when she was like 
planning out certain months in ahead, like where she was going to speak and which country she was going to. She was like a you know evangelist, and you know she travelled round and you know and God really used her. And um, and on one particular occasion, she said it was as if she planned her itinerary, as it were, like all the places she was going to go, the invitations that she said yes to, blah blah blah. And it was as if as she committed this whole thing to the Lord in prayer, it was as if she she gave him a piece of paper with, with her, like, the next six months of her future, and then said, Lord, can you sign it? You know, will you sign it? Do you okay this? And, uh, you know, she'd been, as it were, her outlook on the future was that for quite a long time. And then on one particular occasion, the Lord kind of spoke to her and showed her that that wasn't ideally what he wanted, and that what he wanted her to move into wasn't handing him a piece of paper with all the plans on and saying, Lord, do you okay this? Will you sign it? What he wanted was for her to sign the bottom of a blank sheet of paper and then give the paper to him and let him write it all out. Again, can you see the difference there? Now, at the end of the day, exactly the same things might have been written on that piece of paper. But the all-important thing is, who did it all actually originate from? Because the point is, I mean, if you want to go on holiday, there's nothing wrong with that. And if the Lord wants you to go on holiday as well, what a perfect match, you can go together. But what happens if you want to go on holiday? For whatever reason, the Lord on that occasion doesn't want you to go on holiday. But nevertheless, you go on holiday. Now, can you see, there is a conflict in regards to perfectly legitimate plans. And that is the kind of thing that, that James is talking about here. We mustn't always just assume that what seems to us a perfectly legitimate thing to do is necessarily God's will for us at that moment. Um, do you remember when, um, oh, this was quite a long time ago, probably quite a few of you here wouldn't have even been in the fellowship when we did this, but we did a talk uh, yonks and yonks ago, and it ended up on the tape being called Man on a Cross. And, and what we did in that is that sort of given that Jesus said, you know, if any man shall come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And of course, you, you, that, that cross heads up the hill and it goes in a hole with you nailed on it, doesn't it? Death to self, that, that is what following the Lord boils down to. We die to self and sin so he can live through us. And what we were doing is we were saying that given that that's what we're called to, the crucified life, as some people call it, we asked, what then are the characteristics of a man on a cross in regards, and we did it like this, in regards to the past, the present, and the future? And what we saw there is that in regards to the present, like the here and now, now, this moment in time, um, there and then, the man on the cross in the here and now only faces one direction. Because the particular way that you're hung up on the cross, there was no motion for your head at all. It was eyes front. So in regards to the present, as Christians, we're called to only face one direction. Of course, Jesus said, let thine eye be single. So he's talking about single-mindedness. Obviously, because if we're living the, you know, the crucified life, if we're disciples of Jesus, then our main intent is following him. So every area of life is going to be single-minded because it's all got to be brought in, into submission and compliance with our aim of following him. So in regards to the present, a man on a cross only faces one direction. Jesus said, let thine eye be single. Absolute single-mindedness in following the Lord. Um, in regards to his past, well, the man on the cross can't look back, can he? And that's again back to, you know, no movement of the head. If you're hanging on a cross, you can only look forward. You cannot look back. And, uh, you know, again, Jesus said that, that, that anyone who, who puts his hand to the plough and then looks back isn't worthy of him. You see, you know, eyes front on the job. You know, so in regards to the past, we don't look back. And that's brilliant because, uh, you know, it's gone. Our past, all the sin of it, all the failure of it, everything covered with the blood of Jesus. So, so that's a great thing to know. But in regards to the future, what, what is the status of a man on the cross? And in that talk, we saw it simply this, that he has no further plans of his own. Because when you're being executed, you don't, do you? You're dying. And that's, you know, and again, Jesus prayed... Not my will, but your will. Now, that is what having no further plans of your own has. What it boils down to is simply this. Yeah, of course we've got plans for the future, in the sense that there are, we have aspirations. There are things that we would like to happen to us. There are things that we would like to do. And we're seeing with all these things, they're quite valid. <laughs> but the thing about having no further plans of our own simply boils down to this. 
But ultimately, at the end of the day, we will only pursue them if the Lord okays it. And that's the difference. That is the difference between the attitude that James is trying to correct here that says, well, tomorrow we're going to trade here and then the day after we're going to trade there and you know, then I'm going to trade somewhere else. There's that and that's wrong. And the attitude that says, well, if it's the Lord's will and if, I'm, if, if, if he's sustaining my life on planet Earth still in the morning, then if it's God's will, we'll do this, that or the other. That is the contrast. That is, is what James is, is, is saying. And so therefore, in regards to our futures, as men and women on the cross. We have no further plans of our own. That is the point that James is getting at. And of course in verse 16, when he says, "All you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Well, of course it's arrogance. Because for us to, to, to have the kind of the attitude that we can go ahead and gaily plan our lives out when our lives don't belong to us anymore, well, that is arrogance, that is presumption. I mean, it's like if after we finish tonight, you know, I mean, if Gary goes outside and decides to get in, in my car and drive off, I would say it's a little bit presumptuous. I say, get in your own car and go home. <laughs> Not in mine, or at least flipping ask me first. <laughs> now, you see, the point is, if I plan my future, well, I'm driving home in someone else's car. Because my future doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jesus. So that's the point. And, uh, you know, every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our existence must be submitted to him. That's what the lordship of Jesus is all about. I mean, if Jesus, there's an old saying that some of the old divines used to use, you know, like 200 years ago, and it was, if Jesus isn't lord of all, then Jesus isn't lord at all. And that is absolutely right. You can't say, well, Jesus is a little bit lord. I mean, that's, that's daft. He's, he's king of kings. He's lord of lords. He's, he's not a little bit lord. He's not kind of like 50% in charge. He's totally in charge. And obviously that is how we must live, totally submitted to him. And if in regards to our future, if we submit any aspect of our future to him, and then when the time comes, the day of reckoning, his answer is no, well, so be it. So be it. If the Lord ever says no to us in regards to future plans that we have that are really important to us, if he ever says no to us, he'll have extremely good reasons for doing so. That doesn't mean we're necessarily going to find out those reasons down here. We might have to wait till we get home in glory, till he presses our button, turns us off. Um, you know, but then that, that, that's what trusting the Lord is all about. So the point is, whatever plans we've got for the future, they've all got to be submitted to the Lord for his yes or his no. But my goodness, that raises a question, doesn't it? And the question that it raises is simply, well, how do we know then? I mean, I've got certain plans, you know, like, I mean, next week I've, I'm planning to... How do I know? That, that, that's the question that it begs. Remember, we're not talking about things like, well, I mean, actually, I was thinking next year I'm going to go into business for myself. You know, I mean, I'm going to open a strip joint, you know, because there's good money in that, you know, so I'm going to open a strip joint in Soho. I mean, we're not talking about things like that because that's straightforward, isn't it? You know that isn't God's will because the Bible covers it. What are you doing next week? Oh, well, I'm going to become a drugs baron, aren't I? You know? I'm going to get, get the blow in and I'm going to start distributing, man. Well, no, obviously, if someone's planning that for the future, it's obvious the Bible covers things like that. But that isn't what we're talking about. We're, by definition, talking about things that are not chapter and verse examples. They're not things where you can look up in the Bible. You know, I mean, it's like, for instance, if you were planning, well, I, I really like that girl at the office, you know. Shall, shall I, <laughs> you know, shall I commit adultery with her? Well, I mean, you don't have to look up too much of the Bible to find out for that plan. The answer is no. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about plans for the future that you can look up in the Bible and get chapter and verse on. And that's the important thing. We're talking here subjective guidance, or what I call revelational guidance. Not guidance you can get by looking it up in the Bible. That's easy, that's straightforward, isn't it? But we're talking here precisely about things that you can't look up in the Bible because they're perfectly valid. The question isn't, are these things right or wrong in themselves? Like, you know, I'm going to become a drugs baron. The question is, there's nothing wrong with the thing itself, but is it God's will for me at that time? Now, you can't look that up in the Bible, you know, in the same way that you can, you can establish from the Bible um, you know, that you can pray for a wife and that you're free to marry as long as it's someone who follows the Lord, all right? You can establish that from the Bible, but you can't establish who she is. 
you know, that you've got to go about by other means. And so this is what we're talking about here, revelational guidance in regards to our futures. My goodness, how do you know? Well, let's, let's read verse 17, and he gives us the answer. Right, verse 17. And the principle he establishes here gives us the answer. He says, whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, that verse, uh, it, it stands alone. I mean, if you just picked the Bible up and opened it and your eyes fell on that verse, I mean, fine, it's obvious what it means. But note the context in which it's in. It's in regards to him talking about what might or might not be God's will for the future. That, that's the context that this verse occurs in. All right. So, the principle is, whoever knows what is right and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And what James tells us there, that the way in which we receive that guidance, the way on which we discover whether, in regards to these various things in the future, ultimately they're God's will or not, is through an inner knowing. Whoever knows what is right, or to rephrase it, whoever knows what God's will is and doesn't do it. So that's what James is saying here. Ultimately, it's through an inner knowing, a certainty on the inside. But I've got to immediately make a qualification here. We've got to qualify it. And the way we've got to qualify it is this. The whole, I mean, this is a verse in the letter of James. The whole purpose for the letter that he's writing is seeking to persuade worldly Christians to become spiritual ones. He's writing to Christians who aren't being very submissive to the Lord, and he's trying to persuade them to become so. I.e., he's trying to, to, what he's aiming at is getting self off the throne of life and Jesus on the throne of life. Now, that is what he's aiming at. So, everything he says is on the assumption that regardless of whether or not yesterday you were a disciple or not, I mean, yesterday you might have been the most unfaithful believer in the world, but regardless of what your standing was yesterday, today and from now on, you're wholeheartedly surrendered to the Lord. Everything he's writing is based on that assumption that that is where these Christians who are reading it are heading for. And one of the perks of being a disciple, regardless of whether you were yesterday or not, if you're a disciple today, and are going to remain so, I'm not talking about one of these people that they're a disciple on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, but the other four days of the week they're, they're not disciples, because they're alternate days. I mean, I'm not talking about that, but the point is that regardless of where we were yesterday, today and from now on, we're surrendered to the Lord, and it's serious. If that's the case, then there's a perk. And one of the perk, the particular perk, there are lots of perks of being a disciple a true disciple, and one of them is this principle of the inner knowing when it comes to guidance in, in areas of life where you can't turn up chapter and verse. It is one of the perks. Knowing God's will is one of the perks. Um, go to 1 John, uh, because we've noticed in regards to quite a few themes that, that James writes on that, that, that John has his equivalent kind of parallel passages. And um, so we're seeing now, James, on the fact that if you're really following the Lord, then you can genuinely expect to know his will, to have that inner knowing, all right? And in 1 John, chapter 2, and uh, we'll read verse 27. Now listen to this. He says, But the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now what John is saying there, is that he's saying, look, the fact that you have the anointing, which of course the Holy Spirit, he says, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything. You, you don't need someone else to come in and tell you what God's will is, because the Holy Spirit within you will tell you that for yourself. Now then, obviously, Let's, let's check the context of these words, and in verse 15 and 17, and we saw this, uh, I can't remember if it was the last talk or the last but one, when he says, do not love the world or the things of the world, 
and then he kind of like urges them, you know, to avoid the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And, uh, you know, so he's saying, don't love the world. He says, be absolutely faithful to God instead. So the context is that John says that of disciples. He says that of disciples. And then in verse 28, which is the verse immediately following, he says, and now, little children, abide in him. I live your life moment by moment in Jesus himself through his power. So the point is that these verses here, I mean, yeah, you could get, you know, a believer who's wayward and rebellious or something like that, you know, and, and, and is fighting God's will. And, you know, and then they could say, oh, well, I don't have to listen to anyone else because the anointing teaches me. I mean, yeah, I mean, that would be to hook a verse like this totally out of context because it's written to disciples. It's written to people with, you know, for whom it's a foregone conclusion that part of their life is, is, is that in an abundance of counsellors is safety. It's written on that assumption. You know, people whose will are broken, as unto the Lord. Not a verse like this, you know, that you could, whatever you want to do, oh well, you know, sort of like, well it must be God's will, you know, because the anointing inside me is telling me I'm right. You know, and, and, and whatever, and you know, I mean, I hate your guts, and, and I'm right. You know, that, that sort of thing. Um, it's, he's writing it, it's assumed that disciples are reading it. So there, again, you have it. John is saying, look, in regards to certain things, regards to things in general, you can be absolutely confident that you can know that the anointing will teach you everything. When you've got issues where you can read it black and white in the Bible, well, you, you just read it in the Bible, boom, boom, no problem, that's subjective. But when it comes to subjective things, such as we're talking about here, then you can trust that you can actually know now, the reason that I've made that qualification, that this only applies to disciples, all right, and it's a perk for a disciple, is that obviously, if you get believers who are worldly, all right, um, and, you know, like believers such as James is writing to, who will not make the transition, so they're saying, well, no, I, I don't fancy what James is saying, I, I like it the way I am, so I'm, I'm going to stay kind of a 50-50 Christian, you know, one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world, okay. Um, if, if you've got people, Christians, who are like that, then by definition it doesn't apply to them. It has no bearing on them. And the reason is that when you get believers who are worldly or carnal like that, the point is that they convince themselves anyway that more or less whatever they want to do is obviously by definition of God anyway. I mean, you know, that's, that's simply the truth. So if you've got a believer who's not really submitted to God, their outlook is that basically, well, you plan your own life on the assumption that, that, that if you want it, then God says, yeah, sure, if you want it, have it. Because that is how carnal believers live. That is the assumption on which they live. So the point is, if you had Christians who, you know, kind of weren't genuinely following the Lord and weren't in submission to the teaching of the Scripture, <clears throat> if they came along and on the basis of these verses say, well, I mean, you know, I mean, the way I live, well, I just know it's right, don't I? You know, and hook verses out like this to try and support their view, that would be daft. Because the context of these verses is written to disciples, not, not people who are only half and half for the Lord. Because people like that get the point is, they don't need guidance in regards to their futures because they just plan out their lives how they like anyway, don't they? So that proviso has got to be made. The name of that game is simply self-deception, and that, that isn't what we're, we're talking about here. But for the truly submitted believer, for the Christian who really is sold out to live in submission to the Lord, to live in submission to the teaching of the Bible, to live in submission at all points to what they know to be God's will, regardless of how they know it, through the Bible or whatever, and someone who lives in genuine repentance when they fail, okay, and when they sin against the Lord, then for a believer like that, this principle does work. The inner knowing. That's not to say it might not be working at the moment, but the point is it can work. And we can know that that is the way God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be forever in a fog about the future. All right. It's a perfectly proper aspect of divine guidance. We can expect this inner knowing. We can expect to know what is God's will. Um, if, if you go to Philippians, we're going to be back to Philippians later, but, but just one verse. Um, now, where's, where's the verse that I actually want? Um, oh, goodness, I think maybe it, it, it might be Colossians. Hang on, bear with me. Absolutely disastrous. Can't remember where this verse is. But I want to actually read it rather than quote it so you can actually see it. Now, where is it? Oh, no, it's Romans 12. Ah, just remembered. 
Romans 12, in the nick of time. You see, you can know. <laughs> um, now, here, Romans 12, we'll read the first two verses. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice <coughs> because we are men and women on the cross, and we're dead. But, on the other hand, we're alive and we're walking around, so we are living sacrifices. Can you see the point there? We're dead, but obviously we're alive. We're dead to self, but we're alive to Christ. So we're living sacrifices, all right? And he says, uh, present your bodies holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there, obviously, he's saying, become a disciple. That's what being a disciple is. Now, look at this that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Or, as in other translations, that you may prove or know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, can you see that? Paul there says, become a disciple, live that crucified life, and you can expect to know God's will. Not in everything. We're not talking about exhaustive knowledge of God's will. But what you really need to know Expect to know, because if you're following the Lord, he will make that clear. So, this is what we're seeing. It's a perk, a proper aspect of divine guidance. When we need to know what God's will is in regards to things where you can't look up chapter and verse, then this is the principle that operates, that we can have that inner knowing. Let's give an example, okay. Let's, let's take going on holiday, because right, it's summer, isn't it, and it's, it's swelteringly hot, and we're all dying in here, okay, because it's so hot and muggy. So going on holiday, all right? Now, now that's planning ahead, all right? The, the very sort of thing that James is talking about. So, you know, sort of maybe, I mean, even at the moment, what, it's June, isn't it? She might be thinking, oh, well, yeah, I think, you know, go on holiday in September or so. That's, that's a good idea. So regardless of how you've done it, or whether it's planning ahead for a really mega holiday next year, you know, like me and Linda going to Florida or something like that. But regardless of whether it's kind of like a few days, you know, rather humble affair in a few weeks' time or something mega next year, the point is you're planning ahead for a holiday, exactly the kind of area that James is dealing with. Right, so then, going on holiday, that's planning ahead. So let's get our checklist out, all right? Now then, does the idea of holidays go against the Bible's teaching? Now that, that's the first checklist, because if, if, if something is prohibited by the Bible, well, forget about praying about it because God hasn't got anything to add to what he's got written in the Bible. Or, subsequently, or alternatively, if there's something in the Bible that says this is a must, then it's no use praying about it in the hope that God will say, oh, well, of course, but for you, I'll let you off. It doesn't, you know. I mean, for things like that, anything clear, black and white, in the Bible, black and white, there's no need to pray about it, you know, to establish whether it's right. If it's in the Bible, it's right. Simple as that. But, so, does the idea of holidays go against the Bible's teaching? Because if they did, then our question well, don't plan a holiday because it's sinful. See? But, obviously, no, of course they don't. There's nothing unbiblical about going on holiday. No, n no problem at all. So, holidays aren't sinful, okay? Um, so, so that's okay. Now, like, you know, keep going down the checklist, right? It's not sinful, so there's nothing in principle against it. Um, can I afford it? You know, can I, or is it going to get me in debt? No, no, I do my accounts, I can afford it, right? No problem, it's not going to get me into debt. That, that checks out fine. This is all, all the kind of thing that you do in regards to guidance. Um, if you're single and planning on going on holiday, is it a Club 30 holiday? No? Fine. No problem. No problem. Naughty, naughty Club 30 holidays. Definitely not allowed. So that's okay. Passes that test. You know, go on the broads or something or, or like that. Um, or paint them for a week, you know, with John and Ian. I'm sure you won't get into trouble then. <laughs> you see? Um, so, so that's okay. Now, if, if, if you're married, if, if you're married, does, does your spouse want to go on the same holiday. You know, so for instance, if you're an avid bird watcher, dear, oh dear, and your spouse isn't. Um, you know, but, but yes, we both want to go on the same holiday, so yeah, love your wife, submit your husband, blah, blah, all that, yeah, part passes the test. Yeah, checks out fine, absolutely checks out fine. So, I now know going on holiday could, you know, there's nothing wrong with it per se, but does this tell me whether or not it's God's will for me? No, it doesn't. It just tells you that it could be, because it's not by definition sinful. All right. So then, next step. Well, the next step is, oh, this is a brilliant idea, I'd love to do it. So the next step is you ask the Lord's permission to see if it's all right with him. Now, believe you me, for many, many Christians, this would be so novel. You think, what? Leave it out, you're kidding. 
No, I'm not kidding. The next step is then you ask the Lord's permission to see if you going on holiday is okay with him. And here's the point. We must never, ever assume. And that's the point. The fact that there's nothing wrong with going on holiday, the fact that everyone does it, the fact that you need a holiday or whatever, doesn't mean that we can ever just assume that because it seems okay to us, it's necessarily going to be okay with him. So, we must ask the Lord's permission. That's the next step. But I do want to emphasise here that it's the Lord's permission that you're asking, not anyone else's. All right? Now, now that's important. This permission, or not, is from the Lord himself. Now, obviously, it may well be, at times, it is, at times, a very good, back to, in an abundance of counsels, is safe, you know, it's, it's safety. And obviously there might be occasions such as this where you might want to, if you feel the need, you certainly don't have to, but if you feel the need, you're quite free to, to, to chuck it out and to use other believers as a sounding board, just, just to get their feedback. I mean, when I say that the permission has got to come from the Lord, not other people, I'm not saying that you can't get what other people think if you want to, only if you want to. But what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, you've got to find out not what other people think. Ultimately, you're trying to find out what the Lord thinks. Now, of course, in some, in some fellowships, believe it or not, you know, sort of like authoritarianism can go to the extent that, that, you know, that you've got to virtually check out everything with the elders. Oh, is, is it all right if I go on holiday? I mean, no, that's why I say you've got to find out what the Lord thinks. It's not getting permission from other people, it's getting permission from the Lord. Um, but the reason that you've got to ask that permission from the Lord, and that we can't just assume, is you see, there might be some maybes about it. A few perhapses. I mean, just think about it. Maybe, on that particular occasion, that year, and regarding that holiday, maybe, perhaps, the Lord might have something else for you to use your time on. Just a maybe. I'm not saying he has, but it's a maybe. You've got to get permission. Maybe, for that particular year, that particular holiday, he might want you to maybe what you were going to spend on the holiday, sacrifice to him and give the money away. So some friends of mine in Scotland did that, and I was, I was like mightily impressed. What they did one year, married couple, what they did one year, the money that they would have spent had they gone on holiday, and they were fairly affluent, all right, no problem, they, they'd have, you know, would normally have gone on a nice holiday, fairly expensive. That particular year, they put aside what they would normally, you know, they didn't kind of think, oh, well, probably this year we'd have gone camping. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of worked out, no, we, we spend X hundred or, you know, whatever it is on our holiday, this year, we're not going to go on holiday, but we're going to spend that money, but we're going to give it to the Lord, all right? And they gave it away, where the Lord directed. Maybe the Lord uh, would, on that particular occasion, um, you know, sort of have that in mind. But there might be a hundred maybes. That's up to the Lord. We can't guess his maybes. That's down to the Lord. But can you see, we must never, ever assume. And this is why we must ask permission. If only for the fact that, I mean, the fact that the Lord said OK to a holiday last year, and indeed, as you'll find out, is going to say to a holiday, yes to a holiday next year, doesn't necessarily mean he's going to say yes to one this year. You see the point? He might. But the important thing is that if our futures, if our plans are surrendered to the Lord, therefore, this asking permission is the sign that it is. Our futures are really surrendered to the Lord. Remember, we do not have the right to merely assume that the Lord is in agreement with our plans. Regardless of how legitimate and biblically permissible those plans might not, you know, might be. So, that's the next stage. You've done the checklist, we've established that going on holiday, and it could be anything, moving house or whatever, hundred different things, but we've established going on holiday, it doesn't go against the Bible, so green light there. Uh, what's next? Well, now we say, right, Lord, do you want us to go? Is that okay? And uh, so you've asked the Lord's permission. So what next? What comes next? Well, what comes next is receiving the guidance. So, having said, well, Lord, this is what we'd love to do. Um, Lord, can we do it? Is it your will? Blah, blah, blah. I surrender this to you. What are you then waiting for? Are you waiting for uh, one angel tap dancing on the table for yes and two for no? 
Is that the way it works? No. What you're waiting for isn't angels tap dancing on the table. You're waiting for one of two other things. Right? Either an untroubled peace, an inner knowing that the answer is yes, or a gnawing away at one's conscience that the permission hasn't been granted. Now, can you see what I mean by that? A de an, an inner knowing and undisturbed peace that the answer is yes, or a gnawing away at the old conscience that the permission hasn't been granted. So, either, you're, if, if it's truly submitted to the Lord, you'll either have this is where Christians start bringing in phrases like, in your spirit. I, I'm hesitant to do that, because what do they mean? I'll, I'll go so far as to say that you'll either have freedom in your spirit or whatever else, in your bones. Perhaps a generation, two generations above me would say, in your waters. See? You'll just have that sense deep down that it's okay, you've got the freedom to go ahead because the Lord's saying yes. Or there'll be a deep down hold, and you'll get a no, deep down inside of you. One or the other. Now then, through prayer, you can't miss that bit out, sorry about that, <laughs> but through prayer and waiting on the Lord, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, sort of like hours and hours of prayer waiting on the Lord. What I'm saying is, obviously pray about it and then give it time. You know, it's no use saying, well, look, Lord, I need to know now. You know, it's no use doing that. You know, Lord, make me patient. Do it now. <laughs> it's no use doing it like that. But wait, all right, on the Lord. And the scales will end up dropping substantially one side or the other. All right? One side or the other. Now, that doesn't mean that initially they won't kind of go up and down. You know, they, oh, dear, one day, and oh, dear, and, you know, so one day you think, oh, yeah, it's great, and then next, oh, no, I feel guilty, so I can't, you know. Yeah, you'll get a bit of that, but, but the point is that trusting the Lord and resting in Him, eventually the scales will settle more on one than the other. When they have, then go with it, all right? Go with it. Now, I'm sure in regards to these things, most of the time the Lord will say yes. I mean, you know, if, if the result of, of tonight's study was that everyone junks all the plans they've got, you know, you know, oh, oh no, you know, so everyone starts cancelling their holidays and, you know, Robert decides, oh no, I can't, I can't, I can't change my car after all. That would be to misunderstand what this Bible study is all about. I'm, I'm, you know, mostly, I'm sure, the Lord will say yes. But what I'm trying to get across, and what James is trying to get across, all right, because obviously if you trade and you're a believer and if you're in fellowship, he'll bless you, all right? But what James was trying to get across is that we must never just assume that our plans, no matter what they are, are necessarily God's will. Um, we must let that inner knowing or gnawing conscience, all right, we, we must let those things be our guide. I mean, obviously, mistakes are going to be made, but that does not matter. Honest mistakes are not sins, all right. So, obviously, mistakes are going to be made. There are going to be many occasions when, in regards to something, we honestly thought the Lord was saying no, and then later on we think, oh, yeah, I know now it could have been a yes, you know, I, I, you know, I got that wrong. So you'll learn with it. Alternatively, there'll be other things where you've honestly, honestly believed that the answer was yes, and then maybe you go ahead and discover that, in actual fact, the answer was no. What about honestly? I'm not saying that, for instance, um, oh, well, you know, I mean, I, well, I want to, I want to buy a new car, all right. And, and then really you know the Lord's saying no, but, but, but then you go ahead and make out that it's well, you know, an honest mistake. I'm not, I'm not talking about when we deceive ourselves like that, but I'm talking about honest mistakes. If you go ahead and do something, thinking the Lord is saying yes, and then you discover he was saying no, it's no problem at all. Honest mistakes are not a problem. And obviously we learn from them. I mean, trial and error is part of, of, of how we grow in the Lord. And, uh, you know, but, but what we've got to, to underline here, and the point to get here in regards to this, um, is, is that we're seeing a principle. And the principle that we're seeing here is, is, is that if you go against that inner knowing, or if you go against that gnawing conscience, if you do that in regards to issues that aren't chapter and verse, all right, then what we're seeing is that to go against 
conscience or peace is as sinful as if you were going against something that was actually black and white in the Bible. So now we've got to read James, his 17th verse again. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So this principle that we're seeing is that on issues which are not like there's no chapter and verse in the Bible that covers it, for issues like that, if we go against the inner knowing and conscience. If we go against that, then it is the equivalent of going against what the Word of God says black and white in regards to other things. Can you see? So what we've got is this. In many areas of life, the Bible shows us the way black and white. It's there, chapter and verse. But in other areas of life, there is no chapter and verse. The Bible gives you an overall kind of outlook, but there's no chapter and verse. For issues like that, and of course future plans come under that category, for issues like that, we must go according to our conscience and according to that inner knowing. So, on issues that aren't covered by the Bible, our conscience, our inner knowing, becomes the Word of God to us. Now, can you see that principle? Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, James obviously isn't talking about that which is recorded in the Bible. There'd be no need to. He's talking about the areas of life where you cannot turn up chapter and verse. And in regards to that, then it's conscience, it's the inner knowing, it's the peace inside of us that we must allow to direct us. And to knowingly go against it, in God's eyes, is as sinful as going directly against the Word of God. And here's the reason. In areas where the Bible covers chapter and verse, we know full well that to go against this, to go against God, so it's sin. Now, in areas where the Bible doesn't cover it, chapter and verse, if we have inner peace about where God wants us to go, or if we have a conscience, a troubled conscience about something that we're doing, really, we know that that is as surely our guide as if we were reading the Bible. And going against it is going against God as knowingly as if we were blatantly going against the Bible. So that is the principle. Uh, if, if you go to Romans 14, we'll, we'll see it again from Paul, um, albeit covering slightly different areas. Um, I mean, we certainly touched on this when we were doing the Law and Grace series, weren't we? Because we were looking at the, the whole area of, uh, you know, kind of morally neutral areas and things like that. And, uh, you know, sort of like what we largely saw there is that if, if, if an area is morally neutral, I have no right whatsoever to try and impose anything on you. That would be a sin, all right? But on myself, I must impose my conscience. You see, that, that, that's the point, morally neutral areas. I must do what I know is right for me, but I must never assume that what is right for me is also right for you. See, God may lead you totally differently in regards to the morally neutral areas. And uh, in chapter 14, um, so, sorry, yeah, Romans 14, verse 1. We've got, as for the man who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not for disputes over opinions. One believes he may eat anything, while the weak man eats only vegetables. Let him who eats, despi uh, let not him who eats despise him who abstains, and let not him who abstains pass judgment on him who eats, for God has welcomed him. Uh, verse 5. One man esteems one day as better than another, while another man esteems all, day, all days alike. And there you've got the Sabbath thing. Now then, morally neutral areas. And what Paul is ultimately saying is, you go with your conscience. Uh, again, verse 5, the second half. He says, let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind. Now that's the key. That's the key. In these morally neutral areas, you must be convinced in your own mind. So that once you know what is right or wrong for you, you must go by that. You see, again, Paul assumes that that knowledge is there for the taking. And once you're convinced in your own mind on those issues, you must go with it. It's as simple as that. Your conscience, then, is your guide. Uh, go down to verse 14. He says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for any who thinks it unclean. Now, one of the problems that Christians faced in that society, we don't today, was, for instance, things like, if you're invited to, you know, sort of a dinner party, so your <coughs> non-Christian friends invite you to a dinner party, 
Uh, what do you do if the meat that they serve up, the food they serve up, has been um, offered to idols? What do you do? Now, the reason that that issue came up is that many Christians felt that they couldn't, in all conscience, eat it. Because they quite rightly believed it had been offered to demons. Now, Paul has to cover that. What do you do? And his argument is this. Look, the fact that it's been offered to demons, and the fact that demons are nothing, means that it doesn't matter if it's been offered to demons. So what? Demons are nothing. You feel free to eat. But if a believer, if their conscience tells them, no, how can I eat food that's been offered to a demon? To my mind, this is dishonouring to the Lord. Well, then nevertheless, even though it's not objectively dishonouring the Lord to eat meat that's been offered to idols, if an individual believer is convinced that it is wrong in the Lord's eyes, well, if they then eat meat, believing it to be wrong, they're sinning. Whether they're right or wrong in that issue about whether it's a sin or not isn't the point. Remember, we're covering morally neutral areas here, right? We're not dealing with moral areas where the Bible is black and white, you know, saying in certain circumstances it's all right to get drunk then, or in certain circumstances it's all right to steal. We're not saying that at all. We're dealing with morally neutral areas. But here's the point. It is not, God does not consider it, all right, uh, a problem if meat is offered to an idol. It's not a problem to God because he knows the idol's nothing. He doesn't feel insecure about it. Now, if my understanding is that, that God doesn't mind, I'm free to eat meat that's been handed to idols. But if you've got another believer who, for whatever reason, is convinced that God must hate it, well, then how can he eat it? You see the point? His understanding is that God would, you know, hate that. So, therefore, he mustn't do it. So, the thing is, what, what Paul's saying, look, nothing is as unclean in itself. But if it's unclean for you, then it becomes unclean. Therefore, if it's unclean for you, you must stay away from it like the plague. But if it's not unclean for me, there's no problem. Can you see, your conscience in the Lord is your guide as to what to do in regards to these problems that come up that are biblically morally neutral. Now, obviously, a lot of the problems they face, we don't meet offered to idols. It doesn't happen today. But the key, or summing up in verse 23 at the end of Romans 14, and you'll see the parallel between this and the verse we've seen in James, he says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So what he's saying, if you sit down to eat that meat and suddenly you've got doubts, you think, oh crumbs, I think the Lord would hate it. Then don't, don't eat, don't eat. If your conscience is clear and it doesn't trouble you, no problem. Because the point is, what is faith? Forsaking all, I trust him. Faith is responding and doing what you think God's will is at any one time. So therefore, if you think it's not God's will for you to eat that meat, well, you mustn't. If you think God doesn't mind, then you're free to. But the point is, whatever doesn't come from faith is sin. So there you've got it. For areas that aren't black and white covered in the Bible, then your guide, your word of God, your Ten Commandments, is that inner knowing and your own conscience. That is the principle that James is establishing here. I mean, I'll give you, uh, you know, an example in regards to myself. Um, hang on. I've lost that. I've lost that place now. Let me um, just just read um, verse twenty three um, again. He says, "But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin." Now, for me personally, let me give you the example of me and booze. All right, alcohol. Now, my faith, my conscience leads me to this situation. I will not. If we, if we have people round to our house, all right? Now, this, this isn't when I'm in other people's houses. This is if people come round to us, to my house, I will not get alcohol out. Now, I'm not teetotal, all right? So this isn't a teetotal stance. But I will not get teetotal, uh, sorry, alcohol out if it means giving it to someone who might have a drink problem can't always be sure, or someone who has then got to drive home. Because I am convinced that there is a link between drinking and driving and killing people and maiming people. I'm convinced of that. Even a half a pint. I am convinced that if you drink half a pint and get in your car and drive, I am convinced that your judgment is impaired. Now, that is my conscience, that is my faith. 
Therefore, can you see that if I was to present you with alcohol under either of those two scenarios, and of course it becomes difficult, because say you've got a husband and wife, or say you've got two people and I know only one of them is driving, if I get some wine out with the meal, well, how, how do I know that the person who's driving is not going to have any? Can you see the point? So therefore, my conscience basically leads us to the fact that unless, virtually, unless we have people staying with us overnight, in which case it would be different, you know, people staying overnight who didn't have to drive and I knew for a fact they didn't have a drink problem, then, if I thought it was worth spending the money, <laughs> there's that as well, I'd be happy to buy a bottle of wine with dinner, okay? But that is my conscience, all right? Now, I can't, and it would be quite wrong for me to try and impose that on other people. I mean, I'm quite free to put it forward as, don't you think this is sensible? But I am not free to impose this on other people as if it was the Word of God. Because it isn't the Word of God. It is my conscience. But precisely because it is my conscience, and it's something where you cannot turn up chapter and verse, all right, then precisely because it is my conscience, it is the Word of God to me. Now, can you see the point? I can't make that the word of God for you. That would be grossly presumptuous. But because of what I believe, that must be the word of God to me. And if I went against it, that would, for me, be as unfaithful to the Lord as if I actually went out and got drunk. Because I know that that, black and white, in the word of God, tells me that that's wrong. So can you see this principle here, that you must go by <coughs> your conscience? I mean, Paul mentioned vegetarians, didn't he? If you've got a Christian who's a vegetarian, and that is truly a stance of their conscience, then you must totally respect them for that. Utterly and totally respect them. They can do nothing else. And if you have them round for a meal, don't put a steak in front of them. And uh, I'd say if you really love them, you won't even eat a steak yourself. You'll settle down to the nut pie, <laughs> and you'll have your steak when they've gone. Right. But that's the point. They must go by their conscience, and you must respect their conscience in regards to that. Teetotalers. Now then, teetotalers must be respected. Some people, particularly, they're teetotal because maybe they've got an alcohol problem themselves, and they know that they must totally stay away from it. Or maybe they're, they're teetotalers because they've seen the terrible damage that drink does, and they say, I cannot ever let that demon drink pass my lips. Now then, I'm free to drink, if, if my conscience allows me, but you must never mock a rabid teetotaler, because they're going with their conscience. Can you see? So that is the principle that we're seeing. The importance when it comes to subjective guidance, or any morally neutral areas, um, that you go by that inner knowing, and you go by the voice of conscience. The inner knowing and the voice of conscience is one of the ways that the Lord actually speaks to us. Um, let's, let's just see some other verses quickly that relate to this. We're drawing to a close now. Go to Philippians, and this one is in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, and verse 6 and 7. He says, Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, so there's got to be prayer, all right, let your requests be made known to God. And part of the requests are, Lord, can I go on holiday? It's a request, isn't it? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the peace of God. And, and in the Greek there, it's the idea of it being a guardian. It will guard you. And then, of course, if, if, if the peace of God leads you to go on holiday, well, then you can always, you know, sit on the beach and, and, and have a piece of cod which passeth all understanding and chips, can't you? It's always a, a nice thing to do on holiday. So, you know, the peace of God, let that be your guide in regards to these areas. Go to Psalm 37. Get a psalm in at this point. Psalm 37. And uh, first of all, we'll read verse 5. And this is, this, this is, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. You see? Commit the way that you're walking, commit your plans to the Lord, trust in him, do everything that we've said, submit to him, and he will act. He'll show you what to do. He'll make it clear. And I love verse 4, immediately before it. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Don't think for one minute God's always going to be saying no. I said earlier, the chances are he'll say yes, he's like that. He's just so lovely. He'll give you the desires of your heart. This is great. But we'll just end with Proverbs. Proverbs 27, verse 1. See where James got the idea from now. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow. 
for you do not know what a day brings forth. And if you boast about tomorrow and wake up switched off in the morning, aren't you going to feel silly? Well, I'm going to do this, that and the other, and there you are, and they're measuring you for your...